great bio of our debaters, but they all, I think you all want to hear from them versus about them. But I'm going to say just a few, few words. Uh, Norman Adams, a longtime friend, a great, passionate believer in immigration reform. You'll hear a little bit, but uh, Norman was very instrumental in the, uh, the, diff the Sanctuary Cities Bill that uh, where at one point there was close to having an Arizona-style uh, bill passed at the Texas le legislature. Uh, Michael Berry, everybody knows Michael Berry. Michael's a friend of the bank, and he is a nationally renowned radio talk show host, and he's taking time today to be here. Michael, thanks for being here. Charles Foster. Charles Foster is the, uh, one of the leading immigration attorneys in the nation. He served under Reagan, Nixon, Bush. So if you have any questions about immigration law, he is the man. And then uh, Joan Newhouse. Joan, uh, her passion, she could do a lot of things, but her passion is what's happening in Mexico. Border security, the, all the, the, uh, the crime, and all the developments in Mexico. She, see, she lives that, she studies that. We actually have a handout, different websites for information about different speakers. Paul Betancourt, the tax man. Uh, we all know Paul. Uh, Paul will speak a little bit uh, why uh, Attorney General Greg Abbott's not here, but Paul knows all these issues, and we'll need Paul to maneuver through these debate questions, and he's real well skilled at that. But Paul, as you well know, was our county tax assessor collector, and he'll, I'll be turning the podium over to him. And then our, our TV anchors, uh, Sherman Chow. Sherman uh, volunteered to do that and ask some of the questions. You know, Sherman is a local uh, TV anchor and does a great job, and she's also involved in a lot of, a lot of charities. And then Rebecca Zuarez, who is with Univision, and she's also here today to help in asking the questions. So with that, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Paul Betancourt, let's give, give a round of applause for Paul and all of our participants. Let's give a big round. got quite a program to, uh, to, for you today, and of course Greg Abbott can't be here. So for the Republicans in the audience, that's good news. You know that Greg's fighting for redistricting. For the Democrats in the audience, well, we don't know what that news is yet. So uh, we will see, but uh, Greg is uh, strong enough to be able to do, uh, work on many issues, and he wanted to be here today, uh, but couldn't. Uh, and if an attorney general can moderate an immigration debate and handle redistricting at the same time, uh, he's got, uh, he's certainly got all of our respect. Now, for the panel, you've got to overcome two very good speakers already. We've had one gentleman, John Boyard, who has survived nine Black Hawk crash crashes. That means he went down nine times and somehow survived. And Maria Rios is the first person I've ever met that wanted a garbage truck when she graduated from college. And look, <laughs> and she's now successful. So, uh, in immigration, everything is on the table today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you have uh, questions, you can pass those up uh, to me. I'll be asking questions on behalf of the audience. Uh, if you uh, just want to sit back and watch it happen, you'll see, because we're going to be talking today about things that are mostly charged words. We're going to be talking about deportation. We're going to be talking about amnesty. We're going to be talking about closing the border. And we need a solution in America. And you see the brave four people that have come up uh, to talk about it. And with that, we're going to open up our questioning with Sherman first for the first question of the debate. Absolutely. Did they want to make a little opening statement first? Or? Oh, let's go right. Sorry. Let's go to the two-minute opening statements. Okay. Alphabetical Norman Adams, go first. Uh, thank you, Paul. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking your time. It's very seldom that an insurance broker gets this many people to sit down and listen to him. <laughs> I do. I want to do one thing that not a lot of you guys in the room would dare do, and I'm sure it's not in good taste, but I want to induce my first wife. My first wife, Debbie Sue Cheryl Adams, is in the audience here, just made 47 years, but we're, I'm still on probation. <laughs> Debbie, thank you for being here. Folks, I want to, we're here to, and thank you, we're here to talk about what is a very emotional discussion. As a matter of fact, you can look far and wide to find businesses willing to sponsor an event like this or elected Republican officials willing to attend it because they don't want to be asked a question. They don't want to talk about immigration. Prior to 1923, if you arrived at the port first class, you walked straight to your hotel room. No quotas. 
if you looked sick or if you came in steerage, actually, down in the hole, you had to walk past a guy that looked at you to see if you needed to go to the quarantine station. But even prior to then, it was emotional. Many of you read the quote, Benjamin Franklin stands up in a debate whether we're going to speak English or German and says, this is an English colony. What are all you Germans doing here anyway? This has been going on a long time. Go to New York, Little Italy, Little France, Little Germany still today. If you're Lutheran heritage like I am, depending on what part of Germany you came from, it would decide whether or not you could live in Lee County. I still remember when a Polak marrying a Czech was a mixed marriage. And how many of you recall the sign, seeing the sign in the window of the movie, no Irishmen or dogs allowed in here? Well, folks, I can tell you, this, and as was alluded to, our immigration laws are bad laws. They are broken, and they are the reason we're in this mess today. Thank you, Norman. And now for the number one rated radio talk show host in the Southwest I know, I have to compete with him occasionally, Michael Berry. I feel like I should introduce somebody, but my wife is not here, so if Sheila Jackson Lee is, would you please stand? <laughs> no cameras, I'll take it. Okay, what about Michael? What about Mittens, your other Mittens favorite? Mittens is not here. All right. You know, I hear these stories. I hear Maria's great story coming here from El Salvador. My wife was born in India and came and became a citizen in 1997. My son was born in Ethiopia, became a citizen in 2008. And um, I see a system that works. I see a system that works. You know, in 2001, 600,000 people became United States citizens. In 2008, a million did. People from all over the world, not just Latin America, people from all over the world came to this country to pursue a dream. And when they arrived here, they got free education and free health care. They got the ability to vote. They got the ability to, to, to breathe the cleanest air and live in the greatest, freest nation on earth. They came here from all walks of, of life. Very few of them here today, but I dare you, I defy you to go and ask them, is this a racist country? Is this a country that doesn't like immigrants? See, we bandy about this term immigrant because it's a beautiful, wonderful part of our history. It's part of the fabric that makes us great. But let's be very clear. There is legal immigration, there's illegal immigration. What we're talking about today is one very simple question, and I wanna ask you to keep this in mind. We're asking the very simple question, who decides who comes to the United States of America? Because as Tony Blair said, I judge a nation by how many people want out and how many people want in. We just spent three weeks in Africa, and every day we passed the U.S. Embassy. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, there was already a line of people waiting to get in. They just want a chance to come here. Remember, half the people in this country illegally came here on a visa and never left. This is the greatest nation on earth, and we'd like to keep it that way. But make no mistake, and I'm almost through, make no mistake about this. There is a limit to what we can absorb. The question will be, who will decide who gets to come to the greatest nation on earth? Will it be those who on their own break in against our laws? Or will it be those who follow the process who don't live here now and can't be deported because they're in Mexico City or in Africa? Let's ask the question on their behalf because they follow the rules. And now, Charles Foster, someone who's been very experienced immigration attorney. Charles. Thank you, Paul. Um, Looking out, I want to say, I want to thank everyone here. Wow, what, what an audience. Uh, I, I'm just sitting here. The most impressive thing to me is to see so many people show up on a perfectly beautiful day to hear us talk about immigration. And I, I want to compliment you. It says a lot about how important the topic is. And I feel like it also says that, that there's a lot of interest in trying to get uh, good information. We wouldn't be here today without uh, Walter Johnson. He was already mentioned by John and, and Steve. I think Amergy Bank is to be commended. I, as was mentioned by Steve, I've been involved from a policy point of view and practicing law for many years. By the way, I did work for uh, President uh, George W. Bush uh, on immigration policy, but I do not go all the way back to Nixon or uh, or, or Reagan, but uh, on that. But thanks for that uh, recognition. Um, and it is raining outside, Charles, but we'll give you extra right. time. Go. I walked through the tunnel, sisters. Okay. So I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, so I, I hope today to uh, again. I want to. I want to commend uh, Amergy Bank because too few people will actually because this is a controversial issue. Too few people are willing to uh, step out and and speak out on the issue. 
I think, it's un I think that's unfair because I I'm going to say today that what we have to do about our immigration policy is not that complicated. What's complicated is the politics about that, and we'll have time to get into that hopefully in the Q&A session. The other thing I want to do is uh, also thank the, uh, the Heights Chamber, the Houston Hispanic Chamber, but particularly because I'm on the board along with a number of individuals here, the, the, uh, the Greater Houston Partnership. That's a big, the big business uh, uh, chamber that represents the, uh, not only uh, Harris County, but the surrounding counties. And I think uh, the GHP is to be commended because it's taking a very progressive position. I want to, I appreciate the support of uh, Jeff Mosley, the president, Tony Chase, our chairman, uh, a brother in arms on the board has been Stan Merrick, uh, Beto Cardenas has worked with our immigration task force. And I'm finished. You're done, Justin. <laughs> okay. Let's now, see if you. Border security no. expert, Joe Newestron. Immigration reform. What are the fundamental circumstances that we have to deal with? First, we are a great and prosperous nation, and there are more persons willing to travel to our shores than we as a nation are able to absorb, regardless of the entry quotas. Second, some that cannot secure legal entry will attempt to enter illegally. Third, illegal immigration is inextricably linked to security in the borderlands, although the issues are separate. As a nation, we have the right to know who is in our country, and we have the right to deny entry to those that come here for nefarious purposes. What is the reality? Members of organized crime, such as the Zetas, cross back and forth at will. Mexican families are fleeing to the relative safety of Texas, but often they are followed by organized crime and forced to sign over their assets in Mexico or face the mutilation and or death of their loved ones. Violence, coercion, and intimidation is already manifest in Texas. The transnational organized crime groups already threaten U.S. law enforcement, journalists, landowners, businesses, and some believe elected officials. What do the citizens of the borderlands fear? First and foremost, they fear for their safety. Second, they fear they will not be able to break through the denial and ignorance that is manifest in the political arena and in the rest of the country. And third, they fear that immigration reform legislation will be railroaded down their throats as health care reform was and will not address the more pressing issue of security. Until the citizens of the border states and increasingly the rest of the nation feel secure, we as a nation will not be able to carry out a thoughtful debate to address our current immigration situation, be proactive in addressing future immigration policies, and craft the best solutions. In short, our security cannot wait for the protracted immigration debate to conclude. Okay, thank you. Let's give them a hand, all four of our panelists. Okay, Sherman, now we're ready for the first question. All right, thank you. Warm up there. <laughs> Mr. Adams, this question is for you. And you, many others, have been working on immigration reform. You have what you call sensible immigration reform, a linchpin of which is the worker permit program. How do you address critics who say, as long as you've been working for reform, the immigration situation remains, quote, broken because most of America buys into the existing system, from businesses to consumers, everybody benefits from the undocumented labor force. So even though you've got a reform plan, how realistic is it that it'll pass, and how do you address those critics? Well, thank you, Sherman, for the question. First of all, I, I think that what we have to recognize, and, and, and I really appreciate Joan's involvement in the border security and, and her involvement uh, uh, on our behalf with the Navy a few years ago. Regardless, we've, there's no question we got big problems with crime on the border and crime within Mexico that we don't want spilling over here. But when I wake up every morning, and I hope every one of you do this, when you wake up in the morning, if, we don't, if you don't hear sirens running, if there's not a headline in the newspaper that says seven or eight major cities in this country have been bombed by terrorists, then you need to thank the good Lord that day for another day of safety since 9-11. We have a threat on the border. The border needs to be secure. But we have an even greater threat that can only be addressed with 
sensible immigration reform in the U.S. Congress, and that is we don't know who is here. We need to demand, first of all, that our Social Security card be replaced with one that cannot be counterfeited. We've been using this ridiculous card since 1936. And then we need to demand a positive ID, criminal background check of every non-citizen in this country. I don't care if they're on a student visa or they're traveling or for what, either, either, what reason they are here. We need to know who is here. And to me, and, and, and the key to this whole thing, is that we must work on both of these at the same time. We can't sit still and say, we're going to work on, on reform of immigration once we secure the border. Folks, if you have a 12-horse outboard motor, you can come up the intercoastal canal and go around the fence. We have to work on both at the same time, and I pray, God, that we will come to some agreement on that today. Thank you. Michael. Give you one minute response. Do you agree? Disagree? Disagree. We're not going to come to an agreement today because we can't agree on the basic premises. Um, first of all, we don't all benefit from the undocumented labor force, sure, men. And, and the reason is because it's not all undocumented, or as I call them, illegal aliens coming here to work. There are a lot of people who come here to carry out their role in a crime syndicate or as sex traffickers. But it's also the case that we have to remember you're either going to buy a pig and a poke, or are you going to fight back against what people can call sensible immigration or anything else? The idea is we'll bundle a lot of bad things in with a few things that you think you'll like. I would remind you, for those folks who say we need immigration reform, and you buy into the reform because reform has to be good, and who wants to be for the status quo, President Obama came to office in 2008 on the basis that the health care system was broken. We all bought that. So he was going to provide hope and change. How'd that work? Just because somebody has a plan and can point to the system now being flawed does not mean that that plan is a good plan. And that's what's going on with immigration. It's a plan, but it's not an improvement. Next question, Rebecca. This question is for Michael Berry. Many of the Be guns- Be nice, Rebecca. Be nice, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Many of the guns that are used by drug cartels in Mexico are bought here in the United States what can the U.S. government do to have more control of weapons uh, purchased by straw buyers, and what regulations can be adopted without violating the U.S. Constitution's right to bear arms? Well, first of all, Eric Holder and the Department of Justice need to stop selling guns to the Mexicans. The idea that the Department of Justice bought guns, handed them to Mexicans, sent them into Mexico that were used to kill a U.S. border guard, but just as importantly, Mexican citizens, judges, journalists, and, and could have killed the president. The Mexican president called out this administration for the fact that we not only allowed guns into Mexico, we bought them and sent them there, all on the basis that we could kill gun ownership in this country. The right to bear arms is very important to American citizens, not just for hunting weapons. That was for the defense of one's home against enemies foreign and domestic, and we should never touch that. We don't need more gun control. We don't need more gun restrictions. We need to apply the law as we have it. When we find a rogue dealer, deal with that person. The problem is the free flow of people, not the free flow of guns, because the guns don't carry themselves into Mexico. Mexico has a good argument that of the 34,000 people that were killed between January of 07 and December of 2010 on their soil by Mexican cartels, most of those guns came from the United States of America. Instead of punishing American gun owners who had nothing to do with that, we should fix the system. And yes, that means sealing the border right now. Before we deal with people coming into this country, for whatever reason, to work or as part of a crime syndicate, we need to deal with the flow of guns and drugs across our border, whether that's a fence or more border patrol agents. We sent how many people? We lost 4,500 United States soldiers in Iraq and just about 3,000 soldiers in Afghanistan defending their borders and we can't protect our own? That's ridiculous. In fact, it would be better for Mexico if we would stem this tide as well. We don't need to stop the flow of guns through gun regulations. We need to stop the flow of the people who carry guns. Because guns don't kill people, people do. And guns don't carry themselves to Mexico, coyotes do. You stem the tide of illegal aliens, you stem the tide of illegal movement, and you won't need to impose new gun ownership rules on American citizens. Thank you, Michael. One minute response. You ask it, Charles? Go ahead, Joan. Or Charles, which one? I'd rather have Joan respond to my comments. Yeah. Well, well she, she's supposed to be on your side on this uh, one, so we'll save we'll her for the next one. Charles, let's go. Okay, well, uh, just comment briefly. The, the question, no, no one can defend the, the action of, of selling the, the guns to, to the cartels. 
There was, that happened in the Bush administration. It happened in the Obama administration. The purpose uh, was actually a law enforcement purpose in order to be able to trace and see how guns were getting into Mexico. And there was some actual thought given to it, but I think we all agree that it was stupid. Uh, so I'm not going to defend that. With, with respect to the border, uh, everyone on this panel will agree that we need to control the border. But this is my concern when we say, all, if that's the debate, we've got to seal the border, we've got to seal the border. The problem with that is it cuts off any further discussion about uh, an intelligent approach to this. We have spent, in the last two decades, we've increased funding by ninefold. In the last two decades, we've increased the Border Patrol by, uh, by a factor of six. We've spent $90 billion in the last decade on border enforcement, some of it wisely, some of it not so wisely. Out of time. Joan, I'll ask the question from the audience. By the way, please bring your questions up and to help out the bank. Yes, you'll, if the first person that gets me a question, I'll give you a free protest at Betancourt Tax Advisors. So, <laughs> right, that's worth a lot if you've got commercial property. Now, Joan, the question from the audience. Let's talk about closing the border. You're the border security expert. Can it be done? Is it the right thing to do? And what does the term close the border mean? Closing the border could have a variety of meanings, but to me, it means making certain there are no illegal crossings in between official ports of entry and managing the flows of the official ports of entry so that you know what persons and goods are actually coming across so that both, both entering and exiting so that we can also manage the crime situation in the process. Okay, Charles, back to you. Don't you agree that then closing the border is kind of a fundamental place for everyone on immigration reform to start with if it's done well, appropriately and legal points of entry are yeah, respected? Absolutely, but it's a, it's a little misleading because as long as you put that out as to uh, you're going to try to seal that border perfectly, we will never do that. Immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform, I'm not afraid to use that word. That was developed by President George W. Bush, a Texan who knew something about it. Realize, let's be honest, who's crossing that border? Are they all terrorists? Absolutely not. 99.999% of the people are coming here are the people we talked about earlier, the same people that are coming for a better life. And, but there is no legal system. So President Bush recognized that if we wanted to deal effectively with the border, why not route those people into a system where we could show there were job shortages rather than having the Border Patrol chase people that once they get here, is someone's favorite nanny or construction worker or, or, or ranch hand or ranch foreman. Michael, Norman, give you 30 seconds each. Close the border, yes or no? I love uh, Charles Foster. He gave my wife her first job. He's a great man. But to say that 99.999% of the people coming here illegally uh, are not terrorists would assume that we know their name, where they are, what they do, and who they are. We don't. So for all we know, 9% of them are not terrorists and 91% are. That's about what we know of them. You close the border like Mexico does, so that they can shake down the El Salvadorians and the Hondurans who come up, like China does to keep North Koreans from coming out, coming in and flooding their labor market where their wages are repressed. Every country in the world but us closes their border to accept to ports of entry, including airports and waterborne travel, and we should too. Norman. Michael, if we had a system in place, if Congress had the guts to put a system together that would enable us to identify people coming across the border to fill these jobs, then it might make some sense. For your information, you talk about us making a million people citizens a year. I assume you are aware, Michael, that you and I are in the group of the unskilled. Radio talk show hosts and insurance brokers do not qualify as highly skilled. And our limit is 5,000 a year Plus, including family members, which relates to 1,200 people for the entire country. Until we have a system that enables us to identify the 100,000 plus workers that we need on an annual basis coming across there, they're going to continue to come in secretly. Norman, was that a e yes or no? <laughs> Closing the border. We want to close the border. We're going to, it's like a health and safety program. You've got to work on it continuously, okay. Paul. Michael, 30 seconds. I didn't know we were importing highly skilled laborers walking across the border illegally. We're not. That's news to me. In fact, if we want highly skilled workers, we bring them from China and India and Iran as scientists. Uh, it's also not the case that we're filling jobs 
uh, with these illegal aliens because we need to. We're doing it because you can pay them less because you can avert all of the laws. Now, the fact is we're on 8.5% unemployment for most Americans. We're sitting on 15.8% for blacks. And for young blacks under the age of 30, it's almost 30%. You telling me those young blacks don't want work? No, they want to work, but the American employer will not hire them as long as they can hire cheap illegal aliens from Mexico, and that's a fact. All right, as you can tell, oh, here we go. Just swing around the corner. All right, let's go for the next question then. Quite a spirited debate already. Sherman. All right, as an unskilled laborer to a skilled laborer, attorney <laughs> Charles Foster. Um, you, you long have said that it's the politics that make this practically speaking, such a difficult issue. And the Florida primaries today, how do you see immigration being dealt in the upcoming presidential election? And do you think that we're really at a point where we could see some realistic change in the current status? Well, on the politics of it, I'm not very optimistic uh, in terms of the upcoming election I, uh, for two reasons. Well, well, first of all, I do think there's something interesting. I've been involved from a policy. This will be the first presidential election probably in American history where immigration will become a subject of debate between the two major candidates. We did not have that when I was working for uh, uh, President Bush. We thought we were, but once Bush was nominated and he, and he ran against Gore, there was really a very little difference. They both supported uh, what we would call Im immigration reform. There was not a whole lot of difference. Same thing in 2004. And certainly in 2008, because when Obama was nominated and when uh, I thought there was going to be a big a debate, but it turned out when McCain was nominated, there was no difference. McCain had supported uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Now, I'm not optimistic about uh, Congress doing anything until after the election. I'm not a partisan person. I've worked for more Republicans than I've worked for Democrats. But right now, from my perspective, the problem is with the, Repub uh, with the Republican side of the aisle in the House, not necessarily in the Senate. Uh, we've had some real leadership, even with our own Senator John Cornyn. Senator Cornyn supports broadly uh, uh, immigration reform, the broad outlines, not necessarily the same details. But until, we, uh, until this election goes, and I think if, if the, uh, perhaps if the, if the Hispanic voters make a big difference, we may see a difference uh, in, in how Republicans treat this uh, issue. Norm referred to uh, what happened in Austin. That was in part because there are Republican leaders in the state of Texas that realize we're going to be a majority Hispanic state, and until we can deal with this issue responsibly, then uh, the, the uh, until the Republican Party can deal with this responsibly, they will not be able to bring in the largest, fastest growing segment of our population. So that gives me some long-term hope for uh, enthusiasm. If I had more time, I'll tell you, I should tell you what that should be, but I'm out of time. Well, Michael, Norman, one minute. Uh, are you, you call him Michael or Norman? Who are you calling, Paul? Well, it's, I was ready I, to debate Charles on that issue. <laughs> okay, then go ahead, Norman. I'll give you the minute. Well, I, look, Charles, the only point I wanted to make in 2008, you, didn't, you say politics were not involved. They were involved. And it was the hateful rhetoric that you hear spilled from our talk show hosts, both local and nationally, that convinced the Hispanic community that the Republican Party is the party that wants to deport their grandmother. And I, since 1986, folks, under our U.S. labor laws, I-9, we have been legally hiring illegal immigrants. If you follow the law, you have to hire anyone whose ID looks to be legitimate and otherwise qualifies. Then the Social Security no match letter tells you, tell them their name doesn't match their number, but don't fire them. Both cases, the EEOC is ready to come after you if you violate the rules. Now, last year, our brilliant Homeland Security decided they put out a bulletin that says if you have a no match letter, we will consider that constructive knowledge. So here again, we got a government that can't function, can't run this program. We have got to get it redone. The laws are bad laws, Michael. 30 seconds, Michael. You know, when I hear terms like hateful rhetoric, I, I always find that that's what we say the other guy's saying. I listen to a guy named Pioline who does a very, very funny Spanish show where he calls white Americans the worst possible names ever, but I've never heard him called hateful. You know, it's interesting how we frame this discussion, and I give you credit. Real leadership, as Charles says, real leadership is when you agree with me. Responsible leadership, that means doing what I want you to do. We're gonna be a majority Hispanic state, what does being a majority Hispanic state have to do with real immigration laws that are enforced? Mexico's an entirely Hispanic state, and they have very stiff immigration laws. I think we have to be careful 
that we don't use these terms to frame the debate. If we're going to be honest, let's have an honest discussion, and let me conclude with this. We're having a conversation downtown with people who wear coats and ties Michael. for a living. Where Sorry. are the folks that, that are really affected by this? Save it for the next retort. Let's go uh, back. I'll give everybody 30 seconds each on this. Go. I just wanted to comment that the immigration debate and immigration reform almost belongs into two separate sections. One is what do we do with those persons that are here and working but are not documented and what are we going to do as a nation for those that have not yet come to our shores. And I think that you can take those two as separate issues and work on a solution with one because one will otherwise um, cause the other process to Charles. slow down. 30 seconds, <clears throat> or did you want more, or what, Norman? I, I want to uh, just refer uh, to what uh, Michael said. I, I, uh, the, about the Hispanic, Hispanic Americans are offended by language on, on talk radio, uh, in the debate, and, and they, they do identify with this issue. They identify with this issue. Uh, Norman pointed out, to date, large numbers of people have come here. They're outside of the legal system. It's true. And by the way, no one defends illegal immigration. I'm against it 100 percent. I believe in a strong border security. But I also recognize that as, uh, the, the contributing factor of illegal immigration is it started when we closed off all legal uh, loopholes. So politicians will say all the time, we want these people to comply with the law, get in line, come in legally. That is legally impossible. No, We've, well, you know, we, we, have, we have a really burning reason to have a legal system. And in spite of what Michael says, that we indicate we have too many immigrants, the fact is, folks, that you folks are not, including you, you're not having enough children. You're not having enough children. Our birth rate in this country is now less than 2.1. It takes 2.1 for a society to survive. To get it to 2.1, you have to add the babies of illegal immigrants. Russia has declared a national holiday. Go home and procreate. Turn out the lights and do something for your country. <laughs> they are in Japan. They're paying you $3,500 a year to age 14 to have a child. We need these immigrants, Michael, and we can make good Republicans out of them if you'll just quit screaming at them. <laughs> Michael, I've got to give you a minute to respond to that one. <laughs> I'm still having trouble with the idea that we have almost 30% unemployment amongst young blacks in this country. We have no job opportunities, and honestly, people don't want to hire young blacks in this country. And yet, we desperately need to import workers. I mean, let's just admit it. We don't want to hire young black workers. We'd much rather import Mexican workers. If we can do that, we can have an honest conversation. But until then, I don't need to know about birth rates because I'm looking at unemployment rates. I'm looking at social programs. I'm looking at people without opportunities that know good and well that there are plenty of jobs out there. They don't want to hire them. And as long as you don't take away the alternative to break the law and hire cheaper labor, that's exactly what's going to happen. Why can't we get these young folks hired? Because they have an alternative coming here from Mexico, breaking the law. That's Guys, the fact. I will say this, but both Norman and to Michael, I know my party needs help in the presidential campaign. I hope, wish you guys were writing scripts for my two top candidates. Hey, no, okay, uh, uh, Rebecca. Paul, I had go. 20 seconds left. Yeah. I did. I had 19. Can I just say this final thing? Okay. I want to be, I, I take real offense to the idea, and I'm not talking about this panel because we're all friends. Oh, no, we're not offensive. Right. I want to take real offense <laughs> to the fact that people who wear coats and ties and live in gated communities and sit down front at the ball game think that any white person who wants to enforce immigration laws is some hateful person. Most of them are married across their racial lines or go to church across the racial lines. This nonsense needs to stop because it's at least as hateful. All right, next question. Rebecca. Norman, uh, talking about children, families are separated when parents or guardians are deported and the U.S. born children stay here under difficult circumstances. How is this affecting our society and what support mechanisms should the U.S. government put in place to help these children? Well, it is certainly affecting those families and you don't have to look very far to find out the, the, tra to find the tragic stories. We, whether people like it or not, under our Constitution, if the baby was born here, that baby is a citizen. You can argue that till the cows come home, folks, but that is the law. And, and to deport a breadwinning father or mother who has no violent criminal record is absurd. It's just as absurd 
is refusing to issue a driver's license to people to whom we have sold an automobile or a truck. We've got people that have been residing here 15, 20 years, working, never been in trouble for anything, and since 2009, we won't even renew their driver's license. So do you think, ladies and gentlemen, that if they get in an accident on the road with you, that they just might leave? Do you think they'll be uninsured without a driver's license? You can't buy insurance. And, and, and we, you know, it's like refusing an inoculation to the children of immigrant children at like on a communicable disease. Refusing to issue a driver's license makes no sense at all, but it falls right in line with what Michael uh, proposes. He doesn't want to issue them a driver's license, and, and he doesn't want to issue them a permanent ID so that we could tax them a penalty tax and fine them, but get them out of the shadows. And Michael, if they were not in the shadows, those average wages would come up. Do you think an illegal immigrant with a with a note with a stolen social security number who is paying taxes, you think he's going to argue with his boss about wages? No. If you would give these people legal status of some kind, not citizenship, your average wages would all go up. Rebecca, uh, let's add to your question because we got a lot of questions from the audience here. What do you say to the person whose grandmother is patiently waiting to come here legally? What do you suggest what to do with children born here uh, from illegals? Uh, there's a lot of questions about the breakup of families. Uh, one minute response from anybody on the panel. Agree or disagree with Norman? I'll say, when you talk about breaking up families, we sent 62 young black men between the ages of 18 and 40 to prison last year for the possession of trace amounts of drugs. 62,000 families lost their father and their breadwinner for the possession of trace amounts of drugs. In most of those cases, the drugs are less than the hit you get from your average beer, at least your American-made watered-down beer. But the point is... We're sending people to prison and breaking up families over a drug war. Anybody here want to quit that? I do. It's ridiculous. But I don't hear the call for that, I guess, because we're not personally profiting from that. I'm not saying anyone here is. Let me say this. It's a major part of our economy, cheap labor that's being imported from Mexico. I will not buy the argument that we need to import workers. When I look at the un unemployment numbers of almost 30% of young black men, tell me why we can't hire these people. Yeah. Do they not want to work, or do we just not want to hire them? We're Let sending people to, to prison and spending billions on a silly drug war that breaks up families every single day. Charles, 30-second yeah. rebuttal. Well, first of all, I, uh, at one point I do agree with Michael on about, about, the, about drugs in the United States. We are, I mean, the, part of the problems in Mexico is that the cartels are, are the uh, suppliers of the drugs in the United States, and if we could deal with the drugs here in the United States, we would come a long way closer to uh, dealing with Mexico. But I do want to fundamentally object to what my, um, the Michael's premise very strongly. Lab uh, companies here are not, are not seeking out and in, in importing workers cheaply in order to avoid hiring uh, African Americans or anyone else. These workers are here, they've come in because there, there were jobs, they learned about it, and they've showed up. I know companies will go out and they recruit. They will recruit. Many of those African Americans do not take those jobs because they have better opportunities. You can criticize our social welfare system too. Maybe they, they're not willing to go and take some of those jobs because they're not uh, wage-wise that are Charles, let's, let's go to another okay. question. Uh, lots of questions from the audience, Joe. Well, they turned your mic off. All right, you got it, Joan. A lot of questions here from the audience for you. Uh, and they basically start with, uh, one of the consensus uh, views of the audience, at least this question, was that sheriffs think that the border is safer than ever, not more, nor, you know, more dangerous than ever, but safer than ever. We also got questions on the other side. What about Hezbollah coming through Mexico and South America? And obviously, uh, current laws you know, heavily favor uh, countries on our southern border. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the border. Tell us what's really going on in two minutes on the border. There is. Is my mic on? Yes. Okay. There is clearly a case for the argument that the border has never been safer if you put it in terms of people and dollars. We have started focusing on the border. We have started putting more people on the border, although they're pulling the National Guard in Texas, I believe, the end of this month, maybe today. Um, so. If you're a politician and you say the, board has the border has never been safer, then yes, that may be correct because there are more people here and there's more funding going towards the border. But 
The violence level is so high. The extent to which the violence has seeped into Texas communities is so severe that you don't even hear the cry for help now in Houston from those communities that are right on the river. There was a, oh, um, and what then about Hezbollah, here, Hezbollah and that sort of thing. Well, the first indication of Hezbollah uh, um, bringing terrorists in was a case probably 10 years ago um, in Tijuana where a fellow was knowingly uh, bringing Hezbollah members in. Um, there's been recent investigative reporting here in Houston talking about the ability to get into the United States several thousand people a month that cost twenty to twenty five thousand dollars from eastern europe to get here not all of those people they're primarily from the middle east are here for nefarious purposes but clearly some could be and the smugglers don't ask questions they get a higher price for someone from the middle east one minute okay i've got to disagree a little bit with joan i think part of the problem is and it's, an, it's a human uh, uh something we tend to project. There's a terrible uh, violence in Mexico uh, between fight cartels fighting over territories and other things, but there's very little actual uh, uh, violence in the United uh, crossing the border. And that scares uh, voters, and that's all this stuff we got to secure the border. Uh, statistically speaking, this is a fact. The border communities in Texas are, for, uh, are safer than Houston, Austin, Texas. They have the lowest, the lowest rate of crimes of any portion of the state of Texas. The crime rate in Arizona, everyone thinks it's out of rate. The, the crime rate in Arizona is the lowest since 1965. Uh, John Boehner went down and said, we've got this violence in, on the border is so terrible. Somebody pointed out that the violence in his district was four times greater than all of the border communities of Texas put together with a 10 times more uh, population. Yes, there's always a possibility that someone bad could cross the border. That's why we need reform so we can focus on those individuals. Sure. Sure, man. Next question. Um, at the very beginning of the debate, Mr. Barry, you said that just because something's broken and I have a plan doesn't mean that this plan is a good plan. It's not a good plan. So what is your plan? Does it involve deporting 10 to 12 million people? It involves deporting however many people are here illegally. But first, before you deal with that problem, the immediate problem is we've talked about the flow of drugs across the border. We've talked about the flow of guns across the border. We're talking about the negative effect we're having on a civil war that's going on in Mexico. Stratford determined that Mexico is the most dangerous place in the world today, more dangerous than Iraq or Afghanistan. That's frightening, and we're contributing to that. How do we stop? You build a wall. You stop it. If we can defend the border of Iraq or Afghanistan, I know we can defend the border of Mexico. Now, why wouldn't we? Or better question, if we have immig immigration reform, and all the people have their IDs, and all the workers are doing what they're supposed to, and all the employers are doing what they're supposed to, we can probably assume that no one else in the world would want to come into the country, right? Because we'd have a process for it. Wrong. We will always have more people who want to come to this country than we can accommodate. And that's unfortunate. But let's be very clear. We're making decisions every single day when we let the people who decide they're coming in come in instead of us deciding. And the people who are unfortunate enough not to be our contiguous neighbors, those in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East, and, and far South America, those folks are left out in the cold. Those folks are the ones who, if one family member comes up here, they have a busted up family member because we don't have space for them. Or if we want to import workers, we don't have space for them that we can bring them into work. Because we've let the people come into this country who decide they're coming in against our wishes, not the people who we chose to let come into our country. But at some point, just as we make tough decisions, if you break the law, we're going to have to remove you. And if we said that in 1986 when President uh, Reagan gave one million people amnesty, we had one million illegal aliens by the federal government's count. And we'd know because they came forward to become citizens in 1986. And here we are, 35 years later, 25 years later, 25 years later with 12 to 20 million. How well did amnesty work? It didn't. Norman, one minute response. Well, since you really didn't answer that question, uh, I, I would, I'm going to uh, direct one of the things that you keep saying, that you, you Americans, uh, that these immigrant workers are not doing work that Americans want to do or are willing to do. And you need to just look. We've got some test tubes. Take a look at Georgia. Georgia tried to follow uh, Arizona's 
laws, as has Alabama. And if you'd have been in Austin during the session, you would have heard our dairymen and our agricultural people pleading with the legislators not to pass E-Verify, et cetera, et cetera, because they can't get Americans to do the work. In Georgia, they, the agricultural community came to the governor and said, Governor, we can't pick the berries. We can't get the crops in. He staffed the fields with prisoners from the prison system and probation system. The immigrant workers had been making an average of $15 to $18 an hour because you get a ticket for every can of berries. The American workers out of the prison system, Michael, walked off the job before noon. Those that finished made less than the minimum wage, so they got minimum wage because they were sitting on garbage cans, eat, smoking cigarettes, and talking on their cell phone and, and drinking water instead of working. The American worker doesn't compare when you're talking about the Norman, I love you. Obviously, he's passionate. Charles, we got a bunch of questions for you in a little bit. Rebecca, let's have another question, please. Uh, yes, Joan, um, you have written several articles about Mexican cartels silencing the media through different tactics, intimidation, threats, and even assassination. What are the dangers of suppressing the press in Mexico, and how does that affect the rest of the world? Silencing of the press is an advanced stage of the cycle of violence. And when the press is silenced, the danger for us is that we will return to a state of complacency. Um, the threats are continuing to metastasize in U.S. communities. I differ with Charles on this. I speak with law enforcement officers on both sides of the border. It is heart-wrenching to look an officer who you know is an honest officer in the eyes and have him tell you, I've been followed for the car by the cartels now for three weeks. I have no idea how long I have to live. I have met with members of community organizations and civic organizations along the border. We've been building a lot of high schools down there because of the number of Mexican citizens that are fleeing from the Mexico side to the US side. What do you do when the bully that comes into your high school and starts recruiting the other high school students to sell drugs happens to be the son of one of the top lieutenants whose brutality is so well known that the school officials cannot afford to combat the bullying in their school? I have talked to businesses that will not, their patrons on the U.S. side will not come if the police are not there and the police get pushed one way or another, so they will no longer, for pay, provide police protection to the business. So the silencing of the press can allow all that to metastasize in the U.S., but it also, as a, a, as a nation, be, makes us less aware of everything that Mexico is dealing with. And given how many issues we have to deal with in this nation, it may take our national will away from helping our friend and neighbor. Thank you, Joan. One minute from anyone? Next one. Charles, how about, how about I just give the question? Lots of questions from the audience for you, talking about your experience uh, in various administrations, but specifically, why can't the Amer Mexican government take care of, the, uh, of their own business? Uh, what about going back to Mexico, uh, basically paying a, uh, a fee to get in line to, for immigration? Uh, you know, obviously we've had uh, you know, $28. I think there's a Greater Houston Partnership handout out that you've got people making $28 an hour here. So clearly this is an economic issue. The question is, what's your solution? Do you support a Canadian style point system? What is your solution, Mr. Foster? Uh, my solution it, it falls under the uh, uh, the title of Comprehensive Immigration Reform. It was developed in the early 2000s. It recognizes the reality that if you're going to control the border, which we, by the way, we, we've done a, a great job of doing. We have the lowest rates of entry. The, what amazes me is that everyone today that's so upset about this, uh, you would wonder where they were 10, 20 years ago where we really did have the highest rates of entry. I could quote you Border Patrol section chiefs where they say the biggest problem on the border right now is absolute boredom. They've got five, six times more people with about a fifth of the number of people trying to cross the border. But how you deal with that is comprehensively. 
One, the reason the uh, Reagan effort uh, failed was they did not adopt any uh, temporary workers program. So there was no way to recognize the economic forces that where there were jobs, you would allow people to come in legally. That's so fundamental. We need a legal system. Mike's, keep, Michael keeps on saying we have the right to decide. That's what we're talking about. Let's let Congress adopt a legal system that actually works. So if we had a temporary workers program where people could come in legally and go home, they wouldn't have to necessarily bring their family. That would that would be a very uh, uh, that would cut down on more illegal immigration than spending another billion, billion uh, another a couple of billion dollars. Secondly, we need to have a system where you can really identify people who, who apply at the workforce. As Norm said, uh, the, we rely upon the 1934 format of the Social Security card. We need to upgrade that. President, part of the problem was President Reagan blinked when we proposed that, and I testified on that and chaired a task force for Texas. He was afraid that uh, sort of our willing in that we were going to have too big of a government. If we had upgraded the Social Security card and put in some basic biometrics, that would have worked. And finally, we're not going to remove 11 million people. We have a de facto uh, uh, amnesty right now. Uh, the Wall Street Journal said that anyone that had thought that we could remove 11 million people was, would be unfit for the presidency of the United States. Okay, unfit for presidency of the United States. Should we deport 12 million people? So you're on Michael Norman. Well, I think that one thing I will say is I think 12 million is understated. Um, at the height of our economy, uh, before we had the economic downturn, we were apprehending 1.2 million a year. Apprehending. My guess is that we were lucky if we were apprehending 10%. So that means you have 12 million a year coming in during those times. I agree with Charles that the numbers are down, but the numbers are down for a variety of reasons. One is for because of the economy in the U.S., and the other is because of the, actual, the violence in the borderlands. It's so dangerous to pass through that territory that people are not making the trips, the multiple trips they might make during the course of a year and or they're bringing their families here because they don't want to cross the border because they, we have now come from economic immigrants to violence refugees. Sherman, sure, another round of questions. How much does a wall cost, Mr. Barry? I don't know. And I can don't we know afford that I have one? To know. Um, if we can afford a 10-year war in Iraq and a 10-year war in Afghanistan and lunar landings in, in Mars, I think we can at least enforce that. The number one responsibility of the government is the protection of its people. The number one responsibility of the government is the protection of its people. Now, Charles says that the crime problem is not that bad. Um, I would beg to differ. 12.3% of violent criminals in California prisons right now are illegal aliens. The Houston Police Officers Union has been very clear, very clear not exactly a conservative organization. In fact, they tend they tend to support a lot more Democrats. They have been very clear in what a big problem it is for them dealing with illegal immigrants in the city of Houston. A couple of high profile cases that yes, bring a lot of attention to a situation. Are these typical? Probably not. Rodney Johnson shot and killed by an illegal alien who had been deported once before. The problem is even if you did deport these people, there is always gonna be an incentive to come back. The important thing to remember, whether it's a border or, or policing your ports, the important thing to remember is that people in Haiti will jump on an inner tube to get to this country. Not because they're bad people, and I don't hate them for that. I don't hate them for how they look. I don't hate them for the French that they speak. I don't hate them for their, their cultural tendencies or the wonderful food they make. I don't hate them at all. I simply think we should follow the law, and the law should apply to everyone. But we have to be realistic in understanding what people are willing to do to get to this country. And the reason is because if you can get to this country, most often you can stay in this country. That's a disservice to the people who follow the law. See, the conversation we never have while we pander to people in hopes that they'll, the undocumented Democrats will eventually be able to vote, the unstated rule of all of this is, or the unstated group is, what about the people that are still living in their countries that are following the rules, who think so much of the United States of America that they refuse to come here illegally? They're the ones who are punished the most. Norman, Michael, you, you continue to make the point about why we should follow the law. We have to follow the law, and, and, I, and I appreciate and respect that point. 
But I think what we have to recognize with the, is the fact that it is our current immigration laws that have gotten us into this mess. We are inadequate quotas on low-skilled folks. We have ridiculous rules with the Labor Department, Social Security Administration, DHS. We, it's, there have been a lot of laws in our history. I think you'll agree with me that Obamacare is a bad law and needs to be repealed. I think you'll agree with me that Roe v. Wade, which is now boarded nearly 60 million, we just had the 39th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, I think you agree with me that needs to be repealed. At one time, you could own, buy, and sell slaves in this country. That was bad law. Thank God it's repealed. You could kill Jews in Germany. Six million Jews died in Germany. It was the law. That didn't make it good. We need to repeal these laws because they are the problem. You know, I have so Can many you questions. you hear me? Yeah, no kidding, Norman. Um, <laughs> Michael, if, I, I think the panel and all the audience would listen to you if you would invite them on your show for uh, 30 minutes or so. Do it. Can we control the mic? No. <laughs> no, if you're on Michael's show, he does pay for the microphone. <clears throat> Rebecca, next question. For Mr. Charles Foster. Uh, Charles, on July 1st, as you know, Mexico is going to elect a new president. In your opinion, what steps should the new Mexican president take to address deep socioeconomic issues like violence, like poverty, and how can the U.S. administration work with the new Mexican government to accomplish this objective? Well, uh, whether it's the uh, uh, President Calderon now or probably uh, Peña Nieto uh, after July 1st, it's going to be very important as we have to continue to work with the President of Mexico. The government of Mexico is deeply uh, concerned. There's a whole lot of collaboration that goes on daily between our two countries on this issue. Mexico um, does not push people out of the country. It's been a product of the fact that Mexico has produced far more people than they could adequately employ. And they came here for, by the way, the same reasons our relatives that came here, for better opportunities. Interestingly enough, part of this problem will take care of itself because the birth rate in Mexico has fallen off tremendously, and so long term, you're going to see part of that will just taper down naturally. But in the end, there are two things Mexico has to do. They have to, uh, uh, they barter on the U.S. They should have an extraordinarily strong economy. Uh, I, re I remember that uh, Lee, Kuan, uh, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, in, in discussing uh, this issue with the president of Mexico, said what he would give if Singapore just had a one-mile barter with the United States. So if Mexico can become, can take, take over and do some of the production that's gone offshore to China and to Vietnam, that will, be, that will help. Long term, they have to deal with the drug problem. That is very difficult. It's, uh, that's a $40 billion uh, uh, a year industry or, or more. We're part of the problem. We are the marketplace. And by the way, uh, an interesting fact, that, uh, the drug market in Mexico has almost nothing to do with illegal immigration. That's a big, sophisticated market. It comes in by the tons. According to the Department of Justice, 90 percent of that comes right through ports of entry. It, they have, we have 13,000 trucks entering the United States doing uh, $640 million worth of business a day. And, and a lot of, and the drugs are coming that way. It has very, almost nothing to do with the picture of some undocumented running across the border. If that was the case, it'd be very bad business because the average undocumented is apprehended four or five times before he gets in. What business would have a model that they would lose their product four times in a row before they could get it into the United States? Joan, Je uh, you've written at this, I believe, at the Baker Institute. Tell us what do you, answer Rebecca's question. What should the incoming president of Mexico do? Unfortunately, one of the greatest challenges right now for Mexico as a nation is because of the level of violence and the fact that organized crime is not just pursuing the drug trade right now. They are heavily involved in extortion, in kidnapping. They steal uh, goods from Walmart. They steal oil from Pemex. The criminal organizations have gotten far larger than, than, um, than just the drug trade. With the level of extortion and with the level of kidnapping, the middle class is caught in the middle. The small business owners are very visible. They are the ones who are being targeted and they are the ones that are fleeing and the middle class is the backbone of the community. 
So one of the things that Mexico has to do is have a secure enough situation to get the middle class back, to rebuild their communities, and then develop a generation that understands how to serve your nation. And it, it's basically a nation building exercise. What are the elements of your government? How does it serve you? And have government elements that serve the citizens and not serve the corrupt interests that have the deep pockets. You can see why she's at the Baker Institute. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions, Norman, for you and Michael, so I'm gonna ask you both. There's at least eight million false identification numbers in the IRS system. A what? Eight million false identification numbers in the IRS system. Jones Wright, there are more than 12 million illegal uh, it, uh, you know, people in this country. Clearly, the numbers are ex exceptionally high, and Michael's right, things have gotten a lot worse since 1986, not better. What's your solution to solving the problem of, of documenting who's coming across our border? Do you support a photo ID? What's your answer, gentlemen? Okay, let me, let me go first, Michael. I know you appreciate that. First of all, on the issue of what do we do with the drug cartels, uh, I, I think that Joan, uh, combined with John and Susan uh, uh, Boyert, we need to put special forces on the drug cartels, folks. That's not something our sheriffs and police officers ought to be dealing with. That's what the president of Mexico do, needs to do. He needs to appeal to us to put, turn our special forces loose on those thugs and annihilate them. Now, what do we do with these, with, uh, as far as what, what is the big solution? The, the big thing, and, and, and Michael, I really want you to think about this because I want you on board. You could affect the debate. You could solve the problem. You could go a long way to doing it. Right now, you talk about on how many, you got 8 million with, eight million eight million with social security numbers. cards that are wrong. Folks, that's the tip of the iceberg. Every time we have a raid of any kind or an audit, you know what happens? They move from, those are what I call good faith employers. They hire them legally under the system, Michael. They're deducting and matching taxes. A lot of cases providing benefits. Most all have comp, workers comp. When we have a raid or an audit, what happens? They move to the underground. They move to an employer who is willing to misclassify them and call them independent contractors. If you'll look, if you'll Google up construction citizen, you'll see they, they recently did a study on this in Texas alone. They estimate we're losing over $12 billion a year in payroll taxes. $12 billion a year because we've got people being misclassified. If you will pick up one of my flyers, it's out in the hall. It's called an immigration solution. And go down and look at number six. If we issue that positive ID card to non-citizens, not only will they pay fines and penalty taxes, they will only be allowed to work for employers who deduct and match taxes. You want to balance the budget? You want to really get something that will fix this thing? That's a solution. Michael, equal time. Let me first speak to the, the issue of the incoming president in Mexico. And I think you have to give Calderon credit because he took he, – he declared war on the cartels, and he didn't have to do it. He could have, uh, he could bide his time, and he didn't. He declared a war, and it's cost 34,000 people. And you'll remember he was sworn in under, under cover of darkness to be president of a real nation. I mean, Mexico is a real country. We're not talking about some backwater uh, 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 nation. It's a real country with real resources and a real economy. And for him to have to be sworn in under cover of darkness at midnight yeah. for fear that he would be assassinated, I think tells you a lot about his agenda. But it's also the case that his relationship with the United States, a long and complicated relationship, is a golden handcuff. Uh, the number one source of revenues to the people of Mexico, to their government, is oil revenues. And it used to be the case that the number two source was tourism. It's now that the number two source is dollars coming back repatriated from the United States of America. Now, whether that's folks who came here legally or e illegally, you can begin to understand why they hand out pamphlets on how to get into the United States illegally. Their third source of revenue is now tourism. So you have to deal with this issue. And while Charles says that the drugs aren't coming here in the belly of an illegal alien crossing over the border, it is also true, while he's right, that the foot soldiers in the illegal alien, I mean, in, in the drug trade, are coming across trained in Mexico with guns, with, with uh, financing, and with real training. I think when you look at 8 million um, illegal identifications, and who knows if that number's right, you have to remember that about 97% of Microsoft's product is being counterfeited in China today. If Microsoft can't keep their own product from being counterfeited, how do we expect the people who run the DMV 
to keep their process in order. What you have to do is deal with it with the, with the flow of folks. And, and I think that it, it is a complicated issue when it comes to these cards, but you have to assume that those people who are caught cheating will be deported. Because I do think that there are a lot of businesses out there that are trying to comply, and this is what Norman represents, businesses that are trying to comply, and the United States government is offering absolutely zero help. And I do feel sympathetic to that. Well, that's, a, that's an improvement. Well, that's okay, just a I'll bone to you to make you feel better, Norman. <laughs> I don't want to seem like a total. Invite him on your radio show if you want to make him feel better. To try to um, humanize I, just, I just wanted to say that the organized crime organizations also are involved in human smuggling as well as drug smuggling that when you heard of the 75 people that were killed in Tamaulipas, it was because they were coming for jobs and they were going to be forced to carry drugs and they refused as a group. And it was 75 that was announced in the paper, but I've heard unofficially it was actually 125 that were gunned down because they would not carry the drugs. Okay, we've polled between Sherman, Rebecca and I, we have one final question. 30 seconds, amnesty, yes or no? Who goes first? I, I, I will. Uh, and go. what does it mean? How do you define amnesty? That's exactly what I was going to say. Anything that's proposed today is called amnesty. The only, there's only one president that supported amnesty, and that was Ronald Reagan, the patron, patron saint of the Republican Party. And he did it on a very broad basis. That was you got a status, a permanent status, solely because you were here illegally. Nobody, not even within the Hispanic Caucus, today supports amnesty. The only thing we're talking about is, uh, on any uh, measure, is a, a process by which people that are here, that have been here for decades, that have U.S. citizen children, that have ties to the community, would have the right to get an interim status that would allow them to work and to travel back and forth. They do not, as President Bush said uh, to me in 2000, no one cuts in line ahead of those people that Michael referred to that are waiting to come through the legal system. Next on amnesty. I don't think that the concept of any legal status is going to really gain traction until you convince a large number of Americans that it's not just an, another magic wand and, you know, that the, the problem is not going to just continue. Norman. Well, I think the key is, as Charles said, is defining what amnesty is. I like Ed Emmett came up and testified for me during the Republican convention to the platform committee and made a very good point of this. We have to define what amnesty is. And, I, and we've got a U.S. congressman who I won't identify who did identify that, but for Charles and I, and he says that anything that requires fines or penalty taxes is not amnesty. Amnesty would be forgiveness, period. So if you've got a level of degree, positive ID, criminal background check, and appropriate fines, I don't call that amnesty. Michael, last word. We teach our six-year-old, and I'm sure you do, that there are consequences for your actions. I don't care if you pay a, a fine, a penalty, you stand on one leg or do jumping jacks. If you get to remain in this country, which was the end goal and which is the goal for much of the world, they're willing to do most anything to get here. If you say you get to stay and the other guy doesn't because he didn't break the law to come in here, then you've given him, you, you can call it whatever you want, but you've given him a reward. And I would call that amnesty, whatever you require. If you're going to make someone into a citizen or give them the right of residency in this country, you ought to go to the people waiting in line that are wanting to come to this country instead of those who broke in. That's just wrong. Okay, folks, it's been a fantastic panel. So hey, let's give them a big hand. I got a couple of presentations. You're, you're Norman, you're done. Yeah. I got a and Steve, lot, some agreement on the border here today. Um, some, uh, some agreement, uh, clearly you could hear on amnesty, a lot of disagreement on the methods to get there, a lot of agreement that Mexico uh, needs some serious help and some new leadership. And speaking of leadership, Give this bank, Ambergy Bank, a big hand for being gutsy enough to put on this program in 2012. And with that, Steve Stevens. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, panelists. We've heard a lot today. I don't think there's any, any clear answers, but one thing we did not hear is everything is fine, just sit idly by. So there is, should be, we're gonna ask you for a call for action, we're out of time. But you have a brief questionnaire, four questions that's, that you have at your desk, or your table rather. If you could fill it out, we really would appreciate it. If you're that short of time, leave your email. We'll send it to you because we want to know what more that you learn from this, uh, for this lunch. Now, before we close, I want to ask Walter Johnson. Walter is the founder and chairman of MBG Bank. Walter is the ultimate stud banker. He identified issues long before they come to the forefront. Three years ago, 
He was talking about immigration being an issue for our business, for our economy, socially. I'd ask for him to come up and close for the next few minutes. Walter Johnson. Let's give Walter a round of applause. Thank you, Steve. And I especially want to thank this panel. Uh, what a great panel today, uh, Steve, you put together. Uh, their commitment, their courage, uh, their enthusiasm, and to, to be here and express your views on such a controversial subject. And uh, I have been one to identify issues in the past, and I'm so glad I came here today and we've solved this one. So. <laughs> But thank you all for being here. Well, you know, Walter, one thing is that if Michael won't have the panel on, I know Sherman or Rebecca will have it on their stations, right? I believe all of you fine panelists have been guests at KHOU 11 News, uh, frequent guests, no doubt, at one time or another. So thank you for that. Well, and Paul, I would like to point out what courage it took for me to come here because Walter thinks my opinions are idiotic. <laughs> and I have nine, count them, nine loans with Amity Bank right now that I have no intention of paying back. These no wonder. Are good. <laughs> Well, well, Paul, you well, let Michael speak again, so I, I'm gonna, I, it's my tradition okay. that I present re a yellow roses to any lady that I debate, but I also stop by my favorite grocery store, and I got Michael some dinner. <laughs> I got him a box of crackers and some Spam. Well, he's going to need both, because if he's got nine loans to pay off, he's going to be working hard. Walter, you pick him well for customers. And again, big hand for Amber G. Bank, Sherman Chow, Rebecca Suarez, the whole panel. Thank you. Good night. God bless. Thank you.